Hey everyone and welcome to the Phyllis Show. I'm gonna grab my coffee, you grab yours too. You know, one of the things that I love about this show, and I hope you do too, but one of the things that it's built on is the premise that everybody has a story. Sometimes people think that the only stories that matter are the ones where somebody's super successful or super something super crazy happened, it's super dramatic or whatever the situation may be, but everybody's journey actually has such interesting stories. And as you continue to watch the show, I'm sure you found that it's like, wow, I really wouldn't have thought that, or I, I really uh, connect with that person's story. You know, living in a town that I live in, it's so eclectic, so diverse, and everybody comes from so many different places. And without their stories, we really don't know too much about them. So today, I'm super excited that we have Kurt Miyazaki on uh, today. Um, and I'm not gonna do a huge preface. We're just gonna jump in. You're gonna learn and get inspired today. Kurt, how are you? Hey, Philip, how are you doing? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm super. I got my coffee here. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> All right, well, I'm honored to be on your show, Philip. Oh, well, thank you, Kurt. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those of you who don't know, we're gonna get into it, um, but Kurt owns one of the premier places here in Yellow Springs, Ohio, called Emporium Wines and Underdog Cafe. Kurt, before we jump into you know what the Emporium is, what it's all about, you live in Yellow Springs. You've been in a lot of different places. You've been in Milwaukee, North Carolina. You know, what's your kind of background and how did you end up in this little old town? Well, it's a kind of a long story, but my kind of there's a long trajectory for my family. Uh, I'm a third generation Japanese American, which is Sansei. And uh, my mom is from Hawaii originally. Okay. My father's from the West Coast, um, Tacoma, Washington. So both of them made their way to the mainland, to the mid Midwest. Uh, my mom on her like big adventure to leave Hawaii and, and see what's in the big you know, <laughs> United States, because um, she was born in Hawaii when it wasn't a state. Oh. Um, and my father uh, was born in, on the West Coast and made his way to the Midwest um, because of um, a scholarship from McAllister College in Minnesota in St. Paul um, that was, I think, specifically geared towards uh, kids who were in the internment camps uh, during World War II. Wow. My father's family was incarcerated in an internment camp um, during World War II when he was 14. So it was kind of the hospitality of the Midwesterners that actually brought him uh, to the Midwest. Wow. But yeah, so the, the larger movement is coming from other places and ending up kind of in the middle of the country. So my mom uh, ended up being in uh, Minnesota mm -hmm. as a teacher. She did a, an exchange with another a teacher. She was a kindergarten teacher in Hawaii, and she did an exchange with a kindergarten teacher from Minneapolis. And they both switched um, in some kind of exchange program, and they both stayed where they ended up being. So um, yeah, and then my mother and father met in Minnesota. Um, and the rest is history. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's so how me and my family ended up in the Midwest. Now, I know that you are an educator as well. Do you think that you got your passion for education um, from your mother? Uh, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, perhaps, perhaps. I mean, uh, um, my mom uh, worked with kindergartners, and now when she goes back to Hawaii, my mom is 92, oh. and she sees you know, 70 year old, uh, former students. So it's kind of cool. Wow. But, um, I think for my mom, one of the things like I've gotten is the idea of community. I mean, being mm -hmm. from Hawaii, it's a very, um, I, I grew up apart from that, but it's something I've kind of always imagined because when we go to Hawaii and we go many times as, as a family, a uh, real, a real sense of community and, and, and togetherness and, and family, and it's something that we had maybe a, a little bit less of growing up uh, in in the Midwest. Um, as Japanese Americans in Milwaukee is where I grew up. I mean, it's you know great people, great communities. Uh, at the same time, a little bit of this this kind of uh, isolation. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, not, not to over 
uh, dramatize it, but it's, there was a certain sense of isolation because my suburb was um, a very kind place, nice place, but at the same time, we're the only one of the only people of color in the neighborhood uh, and at the school. So mm. it was a, it was a little bit of a different experience. So living there, um, where did you move to after that, and how did you start your journey towards? okay, I'm going to go and become an educator. And then we're going to get to how you all of a sudden became a business over owner of so many years. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, well, uh, moved around a bit, um, went to school. Um, at a certain point, decided that I wanted to uh, pursue um, graduate school mm -hmm. and teach. Um, so I ended up going to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and got a degree in uh, political theory, political science with a, a concentration on political philosophy and political theory. And my, my uh, early in my graduate uh, studies, um, a, a very wise person told me to write about what you have to write about, hmm. write about what you need to do. And so I ended up writing about um, and looking into the idea of, of, of homesickness and finding a place in the world and so even though I was a political uh, theorist, um, I used that kind of that, my, those ideas to look for um, how we can find a place in the world and feel at home. Um, and so that has kind of been, and, and a lot of things in life, especially if, I think in my case, I mean, you know, I don't realize that there are these threads that hold my life together until I've already done them. Mm, yeah. I didn't realize that I was writing about things that, actually um, connect the different parts of my life together. But, um, but that, that idea of trying to find um, a place where you feel at home um, ends up being part of the reason that I'm in Yellow Springs. Um, I never thought I would be in a town this small. I kind of thought I was moving towards larger and larger cities. And I find myself in a town of 3,000. <laughs> um, um, but I think it's the sense of home, feeling at home that that's brought me here and it's kind of kept, has kept uh, me here. Yeah, that's interesting when you were telling your story and you were talking about the community and um, looking to, you know, feel a part of because it, it can be very ostracizing when you're the mm -hmm. only person of color in a small, you know, town, wherever you were in Milwaukee, I think, um, when you were saying it, you know, and then to kind of see you function here, it's like, ah, that makes you know that makes so much sense. Your your desire for the sense of community, mm -hmm. your um, your drive for that kind of connectivity, uh, it, it just kind of is like an aha moment. Like oh, because the Emporium to me is like a combination of all those things you just said. Mm -hmm. It just it just made it make so much. It's like a light bulb that went off in my head. It's like ah, and that makes yes. me so happy. That makes me so happy because that's exactly what what we're all trying to accomplish is to have a place where. I mean, Yellow Springs is a community that I feel, for all its its faults and its problems, like everywhere else, it still has this ethic of welcoming people and creating a sense of, of community, and uh, and hopefully the Emporium, uh, this cafe, can be part of that. Yeah, um, that people can anyone can feel like they can come in and have a conversation with someone else without feeling that they are not part of what's going on. Yeah, it seems like you started building your sense of a personal community when you were in, um, is it college? You met your uh, your college sweetheart. Yeah. And then you started, <laughs> <laughs> then you started building your uh, your own community. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have met my the love of my life when I was 18, and we've been together for, I guess, 40 years. So oh, yeah. So yeah. Goodness. And we've done a lot. We all these different stages of our lives we've done together, which I'm, I feel very lucky that um, that she'll have me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna drink some coffee on that one. <laughs> so um, so how has uh, so you um, you all met in college. Uh -huh. And um, so how was that when you met in college? And was it both of you that decided like, hey, we want to move to Yellow Springs. How did your family make the decision to say, I think this is the place? Well, um, we were both in academia, so we really didn't have too much of a choice of nope. where we were going. It's kind of like, you know, beggars can't be choosers. So we, once we got our degrees, we were looking around and, um, and yeah, and we ended up, uh, my partner ended up getting a job at Wittenberg, which is in Springfield. Um, I ended up having a brief 
kind of stint at Antioch College here in Yellow Springs. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so we, and the, when we moved here from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, my brother who was living in Cincinnati at the time said, I know exactly where you need to live. And he, um, uh, went and found a, a little house for us in Yellow Springs. And at the, this is a while ago. So he sent like pictures, <laughs> I think it's oh, wow. the internet of the house. And we, we signed it without, uh, you know, the lease without seeing, seeing it. And then we came in and it was just amazing. And, and, uh, and we, I think Ruth and I felt a real affinity to Yellow Springs almost almost immediately. I mean, from meeting our neighbors and from, from walking around downtown. Before you saw the pictures, that's an incredible um, mm -hmm. setup, if you will. Before you saw the images of Yellow Springs, were you familiar with the community at all? I had a, I had a pretty interesting professor who was an Antioch College grad. And, mm -hmm. and and when I look back, it's like now now it all makes sense. But I had a really interesting, uh, and actually she was more of a somebody I knew of who was uh, quite a thinker. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I w I was interviewing at Antioch College, I ended up contacting her and asking her about her impressions. And uh, but uh, yeah yeah, so uh, it it's been um, yeah yeah we ended up both coming here pretty much because of work, but allowing us to stay. I mean, you know, there are other places to live and, um, and I, I'm so happy that we were able to find a place that, that, uh, you know, we love more than even me, more than our jobs, you know, that's, wow. that's, something that's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of, kind of difficult to find. And I, I had friends who were looking all over, um, the country for jobs cause you have to in academia and, you know, quite frankly, some of the places might not have been very hospitable to them. And so, and you couldn't really choose sometimes. So you might be in a place where you don't feel as comfortable. And so I, we're, I feel like we're very lucky we ended up here. So going from academia, how did you go from academia to Emporium Wines and Underdog Cafe? That seems like a, <laughs> it seems like a huge leap from <clears throat> to wine and coffee. Well, we, we've always, I've always loved wine and coffee. So that's been... Uh, but what ended up happening was I've always had a, an interest in cafes. And in fact, one of my chapters in my dissertation was on public and private space and the cafe space in the 19th century and uh, early 20th century. And, um, and so I've always been interested in cafes. And in fact, my, uh, Ruth and I have had always had an interest in, in somehow having, having a space that's a cafe space. So it was in the plans before um, before I left academia, and uh, but what ended up happening is uh, Ruth and I decided to start a family, and uh, we had our, our young our our son when we were both tenure track um, and in at the same school, um, which in many ways in academia is just winning the lottery to have two tenure track jobs. Yeah. At the same school. Yeah. I mean, we were just so lucky. So it was very difficult. And, you know, I enjoyed my colleagues and my classes. Um, but at, at a certain point, it was pretty difficult to, for us at least, to um, take care of our child and who was then two. Uh, and, and I don't know, just do it. And other people do it. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for that. But it was, it was difficult for us. So I ended up uh, resigning from my teaching position and spending the year with my son. Um, and it was wild. He's a, <laughs> it's a wild two year old boy. Um, and then, uh, and prior to that, I had worked at, and when I was writing my dissertation, I had worked at uh, the Emporium with Nita Murphy, my boss, my great boss, and worked behind the counter and loved it. Um, and so I contacted her when I left academia and I said, if you're ever interested in a partner, let me know. Um, and I said, I need at least a year with my son. And um, after, a, I think it was exactly a year, she, she called me and said, I wanna, I wanna retire. So do you wanna uh, do this? I, um, I'm gonna put a pin right there because I wanna go back. You both were on the tenure track. You had mm -hmm. um, your son. And I think culturally hearing you say that you decided to stay home is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, how did you all make the decision together to say it's going to be you that stays home? Because in our mind, stereotypically, it would have been your partner who stayed home. Stayed home. Yeah. No. Great question. So how did I mean, you How did you do that? 
Yeah, gosh. You know, I mean, uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think we just talked it over, and that was something that uh, Ruth was also um, farther along. She had gotten a tenure track job before me. So I was a visiting professor, and I had been there for a while without being tenure track. So um, she was ahead of me, probably had probably had a better chance of getting tenure than I did too. So she's, but um, so yeah. So I think it was, and I think also to be honest with you, um, I I have kind of a I, I get restless pretty quickly, and so um, you know I really enjoyed the job, and I enjoyed my colleagues, but. Um, but I, I can get kind of twitchy and wanting to leave things. So, so that seemed like the right thing to do at the time. And, gotcha. and, and now my wife is, you know, the, has done, has had a, a great academic career and is, you know, so, and it works out, it works out pretty well. And it's good to have balance because instead of us both coming home and, and having to grade essays or papers or both uh, doing committee work, uh, she can come home and I can have some wine and coffee for her. And oh. it's a better it's a better mix, I think. Yeah. So. All right. So to take the pin out, Nita, you were talking to her and mm. you're working behind the counter. And now all of a sudden, insert Emporium Wines. Yeah, yeah. And it was interesting because she had done it by herself for so long. Uh, an amazing woman uh, pretty much ran, ran it with the help of the community but also was just a really amazing person. And she's still, she's living out in Berkeley now. Um, I'm very indebted to her to, to for her to entrust the Emporium uh, with, with, uh, with some young upstart, young, young at the time. But, um, but she, um, yeah, she was a great person. And I think, uh, I don't know how she looks at it, but I look at it as it's a very Yellow Springs moment because yeah. I didn't have any money or experience. Um, and, but she, you know, was willing to at least offer to me the space that she cared about, that she loved. Um, I think, and I think it's because she knew that that I loved it too. I think, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah. So I mean, I normally, if we were living somewhere else, I don't think any of these opportunities would come along because we didn't really fit the mold, you know. Yeah, I know a lot of people. You know, they have their own perspective of what the Emporium is. Some people call it like the living room to. Yellow Springs. Some people say it's the heartbeat of Yellow Springs. Some people go there for the exclusive wines. And, you know, there's all these concepts from you. What is the Emporium? What is it? As, yeah. Some, sometimes it's like the bathroom of Yellow Springs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we do have the only uh, public toilet. At all. Well, I mean, it's hopefully it just reflects back to town um, because it, it, it it when Ruth and I were looking to to do the Emporium, we were thinking, well, we don't have any experience really in this, and and one of the things we thought of is, you know, at least you know we, we could fail, but at least we'll 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 keep it what it's supposed to be. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, a space where every, hopefully everyone feels at home to come to come and hang out, and um, and it could be something. I mean, it could be we know it could be worse. We know it could be like an old navy or something, and then it would be terrible. So. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, we, I see it as more of a mirror of the town. Um, um, we don't really, a lot of things about the Emporium, um, are just provided by the town, by the people. We provide the chairs, the tables, the atmosphere. We try to make it so everyone, everyone feels welcome, but, um, but it's the, it's, yeah, it's just, I, and I, and I always say this, but I couldn't do this. I'm not really a business person as, as you know, Philip, <laughs> but, um, but it, I don't think I could do this in another town because it's more like there's a community and, you know, I'm allowed to have a space and it works. But I don't think I could go out in the world and create some business. And, and, and it's more about the community. It's set inside the community. Yeah. The Emporium has a lot of very unique features. And one of those features kind of aligns with one of the two things we were talking about, and that's wine. You know, the Emporium has an amazing selection of natural wine. Why was it so important or why is it, you know, so important for um, the Emporium or for you to have such a kind of like a wine identity? Like what's mm -hmm. the passion there? Because you're, you're all about wine and I love it. You know, what's the, you know, what's the what is it? Yeah, I mean, it, you think about, I mean, we have 
we have great espresso we have wine we have chocolate i mean it's we have a lot of and then we got this great food i mean it sounds like i'm promoting but i mean it's it's really a pleasurable place and it's a pleasurable place to be um you know i mean wine is something that's always been part of my life i started drinking uh, red wine when I was in Spain with my wife uh, uh, does Spanish uh, literature and language and we spent some time in Spain and um, and I associate it more not so much with um, I mean it has it carries such kind of class and s somewhat snobby appeal to people mm. but to me wine is all about like it's a very social uh, liquid it's a social drink um, and I associate my memories of red wine with just hanging out with people in Spain and just you know, it's just uh, you can't separate the social element from the physical element, mm. and um, and so I always see wine as something that's very very brings people together. Mm. Um, and unlike unlike things, I mean, in many ways, beer is a different kind of energy to it, um, um, and hard alcohol has a different kind of energy. Wine has a certain kind of uh, community element, mm. um, and so yeah. And you know, I, when I started doing this, I was actually kind of moving away from wine. I was drinking wine but it wasn't that you know it was, it was interesting uh but it so having the wine store now starts to kind of has really um allowed me to kind of explore that avenue and uh, and i'm indebted to a former colleague uh zachary who really introduced me to wines um to natural wines and yeah. uh way before it was something that was uh um, popular so um uh so yeah shout out to, to zachary for introducing me to all those things so for somebody who's listening you know mm -hmm. and you said introducing you to natural wine a lot of people think that it's kind of like well, i don't understand what natural what's the what's the difference like in a in a kind of like elevator hit uh -huh. you know, why, why 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 natural wine what's the difference well a, a lot of wine is produced uh there's a lot of wine produced in the world and so um much of it is more industrially produced in terms of but um scale but natural wines are going to be organic, so no chemicals are used. Um, also, the way it's made is different. There's, it's unfiltered and unfined, meaning that uh, some of the some people believe that the less you filter it, the more the the more depth, the more complexity you get. Um, and it's also uh, uh, undergoes indigenous uh, or spontaneous yeast fermentation, meaning that it will the winemakers will throw the the grapes and the stems into a, some kind of container it can be terracotta it can be cement it can be a, and they and the the natural yeast from the air and the skins ferment so it's like the way wine was made thousands of years ago uh, we have more technology now so we can take different strains of yeast and put them in <clears throat> to make to allow different alcohol levels and it gives you more control over the wine but to allow spontaneous yeast fermentation or indigenous yeast what's ever in the air is to actually tie it to the place more to tie it mm. to the to the actual plants that are growing uh, and natural wines are generally a uh, smaller production um, they're generally um, family owned I mean that's the ideal um, and uh, they tend to be a little bit more expensive because they're more um, they're they're smaller production but um but yeah but it's a it, it's a it's a healthier way to yeah. consume wine and it's um it's also actually okay better for the planet better okay. you know i mean it's a cliche but it's 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 better environmentally so so that's the direction we've gone and we and also it tastes just amazing i mean natural wine is um i like traditional wines and i've told people this i have you know i have uh, lots of you know old french bottles and this and that but when i come home um I'm drinking almost only natural wine, and it's mm. because it's lighter in alcohol. It's it has a certain freshness, um, and it's yeah. I don't know, but that's so. So the proof is kind of in the pudding. Yeah. Um, as a lifelong wine drinker, I'm drinking more and more natural wines, and I and so feel better about it too. So yeah, that's so interesting because I think a lot of people would um, would kind of miss that part or just not know that part or not know to mm -hmm. inquire about that. Okay, so for for the Emporium, if you go into the Emporium, you see like 
such personal care that you give kind of each component with the handwritten cards for your wine. Like when you take the tour of the wine section, mm -hmm. all of the descriptions are handwritten. There's kind of like a, a, a method to where the wines are placed. It's literally like a tour in the cafe. There's like the curt touch of everything, you know? <laughs> so with, with all of you packed into this place, kind of like a passion career slash project, what is next for you? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I mean, one of the, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm 59 now. So it's one of those things where there are all these, I don't know, questions about what, what, how you, what you do at the, at the end part of your life. And, um, and I, I think we had this conversation before, but when I was younger, I used to always, uh, think about death and the idea of dying. And it was kind of, in some ways, kind of a preoccupation of mine. And, you know, I went through these different phases with philosophers and existentialism and all these things like that. Um, but what, one of the things I didn't, didn't realize because I was younger was that, that, you, you know, I thought death was just kind of turning off your life uh, maybe in mid sentence or midstream. But one thing I didn't realize because I was more foolish and young was that your your physical body starts to give you the cues that hey you know this is you know you are not uh, eighteen anymore and so for myself I mean I've had certain health issues and things and so it's very interesting to me that your body starts to say okay you you can't do this anymore or you shouldn't do this anymore <laughs> and and so yeah so those kinds of questions about the the end I mean I guess I, it it sounds morbid but like the the final part of your life um, have been on my mind. And, and I, and uh, my partner and I are trying to work our way through that. I mean, it's one of those things where I love working. I love every day I walk in the emporium. I love going in. Yeah. Um, mm. And I love my coworkers and uh, customers. And so it's um, the question is, you know, what, what do you do? You know, at what point do you do something else or, or, or stop doing this? And that's a, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I've been thinking about it. And so has been my partner. She's been teaching for over 25 years. Um, and so, yeah, the question becomes what – there was a, an acquaintance who said uh, – mentioned the idea of years of vitality. I mean, not just how many years you'll live, but how, how many years you have a certain amount of energy. Um, I don't think I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, there's certain things, like physical things I know are not going to happen. So – I'm not going to learn to rock climb. I, I know that. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> so, no. so yeah. So it's a great question. I mean, I, we're just trying to figure that out, and those are the kinds of things that um, that I think it makes l life wonderful with my partner because we can talk about these things, and we don't know the answers. But you know, we're we're you know, it's this is this is it. We have to figure out what's going to happen, and that that's kind of what you know happened a bit with with all our life changes, I'm so lucky to have somebody that's been with my life, be, been with me my whole adult life and somebody who um, I can talk to about these different, you know, big changes. And um, it's just so happened that in our lives, we've moved to different places um, for each other. Um, and almost it's kind of, it's been a certain amount of kismet because um, I moved to Chicago to be with her, and then I got. Uh, then I moved to, or we moved to North Carolina, and she moved with me, and then she got a job in Springfield, Ohio, and I moved with her. So it actually actually is my my turn next, but it's worked out well that we've been able to make these big decisions and have, uh, and and be together on that. But that that's what we're looking at right now is kind of what's the what's the what's the last part of your life like. Uh, yeah, we want, it, we want it to be a choice, you know. Hopefully. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, I didn't mean to make it sound like it was going to be tomorrow. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. So there's so because the the, um, the Emporium has such life. You know, there's you know live music on Fridays. There's the wine tastings. There's the kitchen. There's the burritos. There's so much. You know, and when you think of all of the expansions and you think of all of that, you know, next steps could still be there. But, you know, just looking, it's like, well, what do I want this space to be, right? Yeah. And then, you know, after, you know, the space continues to grow, you know, what what will I do? You know, that, and I love the fact, um, 
I love the fact that you guys have been together, like you said, and you've been making these decisions and it's the give and take and then deciding together, like, hey, what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. You know, and it can be, you know, it doesn't have to be the last days of your life, but what, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what's, you know, what's the next step? What's the next plan? You know, the, it can the be next step is for me to, to join the, the table of the old timers, oh! the Emporium, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right. Add your money to the little bucket and keep it that's going. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So. Oh my goodness. Well, the Emporium is um, is such a pivotal role. It plays such a pivotal role here. And I think listening to your story, it's it's understandable as to why it's so personable and how it keeps going because you definitely your passion for that type of community and that type of experience really exudes out. And, um, and it's such an incredible thing. And your story is just, it's just incredible. I know that, you know, being together for that long, some of us are single, so I ain't gonna say I don't like it, but it's a cute story. It's a cute <laughs> You may, you may find love at the Emporium. Uh, listen, we'll just put it out there. Look, I'll be there tomorrow from 12 to 5. <laughs> <laughs> so, Philip, Philip, we've had um, two weddings, one of them impromptu at the Emporium, mm. and at least a couple uh, romances and marriages that have come from meeting at the Emporium. But wow. I remember one time I showed up and there was a woman standing in the Emporium and looked, you know, she, and just from her look, I thought, Something's up, and I'm like, hey, you know, I talked to her, talking to her, and she's like, I'm a Unitarian minister. I'm supposed to meet a couple here. And they they came into the Emporium. She was looking for them, and she married them in the Emporium, and I opened a bottle of kava, and we had some had some sparkling. And uh, wow. so, it was, so it was, and that was unbeknownst to us. We, we didn't know we were going to host a, a little ceremony. But, yeah, so, so lo there is love in the Emporium. Yeah, well, you know, that, that means there's hope. So... <laughs> <laughs> Let me schedule my stand outside and see what I can see. <laughs> a minister on call at any right. moment. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kurt, Kurt, thank you so much for taking the time out and uh, and talking with us today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Philip. You're 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 one of the people in Yellow Springs that uh, makes it what it is. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> so if you got nothing else, you know, everybody's story matters. And you would be surprised, just like it's uncovered and discovered today, how much somebody's story really impacts your life. How much of Kurt's story and his decisions to go to the Emporium and to really foster that sense of community and continue to foster it really impacts everybody's life that comes into that place or hears about it. So if you're out there and you're thinking that your story doesn't matter, your impact doesn't matter, what you do day in and day out, what your passions are, they don't matter. Hopefully this story and Kurt's story and the story of the Emporium helps you to understand that each person is connected and your story matters. Remember that you are the best you in the world and we will see you next time here on The Phillips Show. Don't wait.